Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome one and all to Night Fright. Get the coffee going. Get the tea going. Get a beverage of your choice going. Or even better still, settle in your comfy couch and get a hot chocolate going. Have we got a great show for you tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Once again, Night Fright stands on doing JFK like no other show of this genre does JFK, and I'm proud of that fact because when JFK was assassinated, it rocked the world and changed the world, not only America, but the world. And I would argue we would not be in the shape we are today had JFK survived November 22nd, 1963. One of the aspects of the assassination that most people ask me about, were the Secret Service implicit in the assassination? I'm on the fence. You know, I view out, I, I zoom out on this assassination and I say, no. And then I zoom in and I say, yes. So, way to go, Brent. <laughs> Vince Palomar is joining us tonight. He is, I guess, the leading uh, the leading expert in the JFK assassination on the Secret Service. He's got a great book out, and I'm going to urge you all to get it, The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. It's called Survivor's Guilt, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover, and that'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home. And tonight's a good night to settle in, folks, and get comfy and just relax. You can call the show as well. Vince is going to be um, fielding telephone calls. And uh, just let me get the numbers for you. The Skype, as always, easiest way to get us, folks, because it's free. Speaking of free, the address is Freedom Screen 2, and that's the number 2, Freedom Screen 2. Write that down. I'll be giving it out all night. Telephone, in case you don't have uh, access to Skype, 310-421-4053. Once again, that's 310-421-4053. And, of course, of course Skype is Freedom Screen 2. I want to win. I want to... Welcome Vince Palomara to the show for the very first time. Thank you, my friend, for joining us. And uh, by the way, Roger Stone, I'm still waiting to hear from you, my friend. He was supposed to be on the first hour, but Vince, being the super trooper he is, volunteered to come in on the first hour. How are you, my friend? Oh, great, Brent. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, and uh, thanks to your audience for listening. Uh, it's going to be a great show. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, my friend. Whereabouts in the States are you? I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. you're not too far down the, down the highway then, you know, because uh, I um, every now and then I, I travel to New York City, and, of course, uh, I go through Pennsylvania, so there you go. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm in a place called Kingston, folks. Kingston is oh, uh, in yeah. Ontario. Yeah, it's just an hour and a half north of Syracuse. There we uh, go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Vince, I ask everybody that's into the JFK assassination this very question, and I want to get you on record as well. What in the name of God <laughs> caused you to go down this rabbit hole and investigate the JFK assassination? Because, folks, once you go down that hole, your life is never the same. What was it for you, Vince? Yeah, I could tell you what. I could give you a real a quick synopsis of that. I'm 47 right now, and when I was 12 years old, that takes us back to 1978, mm -hmm. I was in, of all things, middle school. And at that time, the Haas Select Committee uh, congressional reinvestigation of the assassination was occurring, and it really piqued my interest. And it so happened at the same time, I discovered that my mom and dad, still with us, thank God, uh, were very much into uh, President Kennedy's life and were really traumatized by his passing. Mm -hmm. So this kind of piqued my interest along with some hobbies that had his face on, like stamps and coins and whatnot. And lo and behold, what really was the genesis of everything um, at the beginning was I went to my middle school library, and they had a book called Four Days. And inside was a photograph that depicted Secret Service agent Clint Hill. It was at the airport Love Field. And just something about that photo of him with the glasses, the mystery, just began something in the back of my mind. It was like a, like a three-part thing. I was interested in President Kennedy's life, his tragic death, and at the same time I had a, a, like an interest in the Secret Service as well. And they all melted together and just through the years, you know, going into the 80s and 90s, I just started to look and see things that other people either weren't dealing with or they were given a short shrift. 
And I guess my coming out party would be, so to speak, was 1991 at Jerry Rose's Third Decade Conference, or his third decade later called Fourth Decade uh, Journal. About- were, Vince, just let me interrupt you. What were some of those sure. things that you were noticing that you felt other people weren't noticing? Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, uh, to make it uh, just cut right to the chase, basically when you look at the Zabruder film, um, although today it's probably a little bit you know, more people are noticing it, but back then most people naturally have a tendency, just that's the way it is, human nature, is to focus on President Kennedy and maybe Governor Connolly to a certain extent, the nature of the wound, Jacqueline Kennedy's reaction. Mm-hmm. What I noticed was the lack of Secret Service coverage around the limousine, and then I specifically noticed the driver of the car, William Greer, and the agent in the front seat, passenger seat, who was Roy Kellerman, right. they're just total inaction at this crisis. It's just amazing to me. When I look at, you know, like the March 1981 assassination attempt of President Reagan, they just had their agile minds and fleetness of foot, and they reacted instantaneously, and here's a souped-up car that was X amount of seconds, with seconds in the Secret Service is like minutes to you and I, and they had the chance, and here's Bill Breer turning around once, looking right at President Kennedy. Uh, Roy Kellerman says, as one commission says to me, get out of line, we've been hit. He grabs the radio microphone. Bill Greer disobeys a direct order, looks back around, staring at President Kennedy until the fatal shot makes its deadly mark. Only then does he face forward, and that was the genesis of everything. And that's when I started to interview these guys, contact them out of the blues before the Internet, when I was a lot of legwork with information and newspaper archives and whatnot. And it just began from there, yeah. Folks, yeah. Vince Palomara is our guest tonight. He's got a book out called Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. And we're going to be looking at all that tonight. Uh, easy way to get the book, folks, in case you're just joining us, I'm your host, Brent Holland from Night Fright, www.nightfrightshow.com. As always, just click on tonight's guest book cover. Okay, you mentioned Bill Greer, Will Greer, who was the driver. You also mm-hmm. mentioned the fellow sitting right to the right of him who was in charge of the Secret Service detail, Roy Kellerman. Now, neither one of those moved. Do you think they were complicit in any way, or was that just due to other reasons? Well, I have three suspects in the Secret Service, and Bill Greer is definitely one of my three. Um, Roy Kellerman, I'm on the fence about. I lean more towards gross negligence, incompetence, basically. Uh, To quote Lyndon Johnson, um, he was dumb as an ox, Roy Kellerman was. That's exactly what Lyndon Johnson said of him. Michael Beschloss, one book, which was uh, White House Transcripts, Boy, and that's uh, look, something coming coming from Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it was. Now, what they, yeah, really. And what, what thing about Roy Kellerman? Oh, yeah. The other ones, the other suspects were uh, Emery Roberts, who was the uh, agent in charge of the fall car, and Floyd Boring, who was the number two agent in the Secret Service, but he was the planner of the Texas trip. And I can definitely go into a lot more detail and flesh out things for you. No problem. If you want to go from there? We can. You know, Okay, let's go before we hit Daily Plaza. We'll zoom into Daily Plaza, but let's set it up properly. Who was responsible for choosing that damn little curve? You know, when he comes up uh, Houston Street and then takes it that hard left onto Elm Street, 120 degrees. Who the heck from the Secret Service signed off on this thing? It was four Sorrels, the special agent in charge of the Dallas office. And it was in conjunction with Winston Lawson, who was the lead advance agent. And then, to make matters interesting, Winston Lawson, quoting him from his high select committee uh, transcripts that only came out in the late 1990s, he was in constant communication back and forth with Floyd Boring, one of my suspects, who was the chief architect of the planning of the Texas trip in, in general. So the short answer is for sure. Now, interestingly, uh, when FDR came to Dallas in 1936, he traveled down Main Street. And there were other times other presidents visited Dallas as well. And yet he knew about Main Street being the main thoroughfare through Dallas. That's where they normally had the traditional parade ride, as even Governor Connolly said. And yet he'd take them through this dog leg turn of Maine to Houston, Houston to Elm. And again, I, I discovered, I, well, just I devote a whole chapter in my book to this about the mystery of the motorcade ride. There's been some red herrings along the way. It wasn't necessarily a last-minute change in the traditional way we view things. And literally that morning it was changed, nothing like that. What it was was the motorcade route was set somewhere between November 18th and November 20th, depending on who you want to believe. I spoke to Jerry Kivett, who was one of the agents in Dallas, and he said it was as late as November 20th. But in any event, the bottom line is the Secret Service were the planners of that motorcade route. 
Uh, he laid out the specific names of who was involved and the dangers involved in that route because okay. they were going right by the book depository and they were going at a slow speed. Yeah. Just give me a second. We just got a call in from Paul. Paul, I'm not sure if you're there or not. We've been experiencing hellish troubles. <laughs> I can only put it mildly. Trying to get yeah. calls through. Paul, are you there, my friend? So you're not. Okay, Paul, tell you what. Skype me personally. I'm going to give you my personal Skype address tonight, folks. Do not abuse it. <laughs> Brent <laughs> Holland Show. Forget about Freedom Screen 2. Skype me at Brent Holland Show. And if you have a question, I'll put you right through to Vince. That should work more efficiently than trying to do it through Freedom Screen 2. For some reason, um, it's just not working. It's probably Homeland Security at the border or something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've just educated me here. Because I had no idea that the Secret Service were responsible for that leg of the trip. I thought it was uh, perhaps somebody in Dallas itself, or perhaps even Kenny O'Donnell, who was uh, JFK's aide and political yeah, advisor. Yeah, he's the whip boy. Kenny O'Donnell is like, JFK is, huh? is the blame the victim mantra. Most of most people throw the blame on Kennedy. So he was reckless of his security, like he was reckless of his personal life. They throw that on him. And to a lesser extent, Kenny O'Donnell has falsely been made to take the blame for a lot of things. These men are conveniently dead, so they can't defend themselves. And what I discovered, the major discovery of, of my work has definitely been the onus, the buck stops of the Secret Service. And again, I, I name names and produce evidence. It's not a question of this is a witch hunt. I'm a, very, uh, I'm a big fan of the Secret Service. We're only talking about a very small, a handful of a handful of agents that I believe st you know, stepped over the line. What, and Vince, again, what has your research revealed? Uh, who was the most erroneous one? Let's put it that way. Who was the one that may have been involved in the planning? of something oh, to do with the assassination. Sure, sure. Well, like I said, I, you know, my three suspects are Bill Greer, the driver right. of the presidential limousine, Emery Roberts, who was the commander of the fall-up car agents. He was the, you know, the nucleus of the protection, and then mm -hmm. uh, Floyd Bourne. But if you wanted to say specifically who, it would definitely be Emery Roberts. Okay, and let's go there then. Let's go there and look at some of the evidence that you feel sure. incriminates it's, him. Yeah, what it boils down to about him is um, at Love Field, he didn't just recall one agent back to the limousine, um, Don Lott, and he also recalled Henry Ripka. There was a little bit of confusion about that, and some of that was my, uh, on my part. For years, we didn't know the true identity of the one agent in the one WFAA video. Some people have seen it on YouTube called JFK Secret Service Stand Down. That's right, I've seen a, it too. Yeah, well, that was actually my discovery back in 1991, years before YouTube. I showed it at national conferences. I showed it in 2003 on the History Channel, The Men Who Killed Kennedy. Can you and, describe essentially what that shows sure. for our listeners? Thank you. Sure, yeah. What it was, it's the beginning of the procession at Love Field, roughly about 45 minutes before the assassination, and the, the motorcade uh, vehicles are just moving out. And you see the car behind the president's limousine filled with uh, eight Secret Service agents and two White House aides, and you see the presidential limousine moving. This is black and white video, not film, but actual video. It was a live pull from uh, the ABC affiliate. Well, all of a sudden, you see an agent uh, jogging beside the car. That was Don Lawton. And Emory Roberts stands up in his seat and using his voice and hand gestures basically tells Lawton to cease and desist. And three different times Lawton raises his hands high in the air in disgust, basically saying, what gives? And I found out there was another agent that was recalled right before him, Henry Ribka. And what it was was confusing because in the newsreel films, this is not video but films, you can see Henry Ribka jogging beside the car. Then all of a sudden he stops cold. And Don Lawton takes his place, and that's the agent we famously see in the YouTube video and so on. The two were basically melded together, but that's right there. That's, that's two agents he recalled. Now, we get to the heart of the shooting. He orders the men not to move when the shooting began. Yeah, see now him? you see, this is what, you know, I said before at the beginning, you know, Vince, when I zoom out, I go, nah, they weren't involved. And then I zoom in and I go, why weren't they moving? Well... Yeah. Yeah, Brent, you're gonna you're gonna be. I, I think you're gonna be blown away by one detail. Most people are. I, I'm surprised Roger Stone didn't make more of this in his book. I tried to get him to get this in his book. I think it was too late for publication. But thank God my book came out. Well, okay, and I'm leading to something here about Lyndon Johnson. But Emory Roberts, he, he orders men not to move. This this came from an interview I did with Sam Kinney, the driver of the fall of car. He was sitting just a foot away from Emory Roberts. He says, oh, exactly right. Yeah, he did that, exactly right. And then he kind of hemmed and hawed and said, well, uh, you know, the speed of the car, you know, he didn't want to injure the men, blah, 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 paraphrasing. Well, Jack Reddy, 
started to do what Clint Hill famously did, although it was a late gesture, to move towards the limousine when the shooting began, and Emily Roberts recalled him. Now, to get to the heart of that, why I'm so suspicious, why this is more than just gross negligence or a bad move on his part, was he gets to Parkland Hospital after the shooting's over and they're there with the uh, critically wounded, you know, JFK and Governor Connolly. Emory Roberts usurps Kellerman's authority and starts bossing him around. Well, Emory Roberts also makes the decision for Lyndon Johnson to, to take Air Force One back to Washington. Emory Roberts, in the history of the Secret Service, he is the only agent to ever do the following. He became appointment secretary to Lyndon Johnson at the same time he's a Secret Service agent. Secret Service was to be apolitical. They began in 1865. So 1865 to 2014, say to yourself, Vince, has there ever been an agent of the Secret Service that worked for the president at the same time he's a Secret Service agent? I would laugh in your face and say no, but there's one, Emory Roberts. He worked for Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, when he left office, he's on, he's on the record saying, Emory Roberts, he greets me every morning. He says goodbye to me every night. And that's the exact, exact same thing he said about Bobby Baker, the gentleman who went to jail for him. That's right. And, uh, yeah, and then this is newspaper articles. And this is interviews with agents. It's all documented in the book. This is some theories or speculation. This is bona fide fact. And these are things that 99.99% of people don't know about. Their first reaction would be like, oh, that's just hogwash. But it's, it's documented. That the press was wondering in early 64 and 65, what's this Secret Service agent handling all the press relations that Dave Powers, JFK's best friend, used to mm -hmm. do? Mm -hmm. Dave Powers was fired, and every Roberts, while he's still a Secret Service agent, he's holding an umbrella for Lyndon Johnson whenever it rains. You'll see every Roberts holds the umbrella for him. He should be holding his gun and making sure there's no snipers or anything around. Instead, he's being his butler, and he's handling calls, he's handling presses. And again, he was appointment secretary, and even in his obituary in the Washington Post, it lists him as appointment secretary to Lyndon Johnson. So he talk about who benefits. And, and again, I know this might be a little bit all over the map for people, but Emory Roberts was, if I say, the motive of why he did what he did and, and did not do what he should have was Emory Roberts was a handful of agents that took it against President Kennedy, held it against him for Kennedy's reckless private life. So that was the modus operandi. You know, in the early 60s, the mores of the time were different than they are now. Mm -hmm. You know, adultery right. was a dirty word. Divorce was a dirty word. And this is the President of the United States. And a lot of these men felt, they even went on ABC TV in 1997 and even said they felt like they were procurer prostitutes. And one of the gentlemen who said that was Tim McIntyre, and he was speaking for Emory Roberts when he said some of the things he said. So you talk about motive. All it takes is a few seconds to stand on. You know, I don't believe Oswald acted alone. I don't, I'm not even sure he even acted at all. But even if somebody out there believes, oh, Oswald acted alone, well, these gentlemen are the reason why President Kennedy died. That's the cold, hard reality. Kennedy should have lived. And I'll go into a lot more detail if you want okay. to buy President Let me tell detail. folks who we're speaking with, Vince Palomara is our guest tonight, folks. He's an expert on the JFK Secret Service team. His book is called Survivor's Guilt. The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. As always, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest's book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book. Now, stick with us tonight, folks, because we're going to be looking at Abraham Bolden as well. Vince doesn't, doesn't know this yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Oh, great but we, 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 we will be getting into Abraham Bolden as well, folks. He was the first African-American Secret Service agent handpicked by JFK himself. And we're going to be looking at his story because he was railroaded and set up and thrown in jail for a crime he did not commit because he was a whistleblower. And you had touched on some of this uh, just now with Emory Roberts and the fact that um, they were bringing women back and some of this stuff. So we're, we'll be looking at that as well, folks. Uh, Mr. Great. Bolden lays charges that the Secret Service were drunk on duty. Uh, they were bringing women back. Uh, many Secret Service agents, according to Mr. Bolden, said they would not protect President Kennedy as they felt Mr. Kennedy was too soft on civil rights or too strong on civil rights, I should say, and called him the N-word lover. So there you have it. So you've got some loyalties that are not quite copacetic here when they're guarding the president. And as you know, you've got to be razor sharp and focused when you're guarding the leader of the free world. And these guys certainly were not. Okay, Emery Roberts, that's his motive. Floyd Boring? 
What was Floyd his Boring? Yeah, Floyd Boring was the planner of the Texas trip. Ah. And again, these are these are things. What I'm telling you now are very. I'd say again, 99.9999 percent of the public and even a lot of the research community was not aware of this until I came about. Again, it's 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 not even to toot my own horn. A lot of it's by default. There wasn't anybody out there that was checking that like what Robert Grove's famous saying was maybe that's why they call the Secret Service secret vents. I never really thought twice about them. Well thank God I did because I found out some things. And the thing about Floyd Boring is that I also think he was another agent that held it against President Kennedy for his personal life. I hate to say it, but it is what it is. This gentleman shows up at every part of the planning, directly or indirectly, even if it's just through a direct emissary, an advance agent, whether it was David Grant or Winston Lawson, he has his hands all over the trip. And again, this is this came out. Jim Bishop, um, an obscure line in his book, says the planning of the Texas trip was in the faithful hands of Floyd Boring. And I, I looked at some um, obscure um, presidential oral histories um, from the Truman Library, JFK and LBJ Library, and they all confirm Floyd Boring's normal duty was the advance work on all the trips. He even said, I did the advance work, all the advance work on President Kennedy's trip. Usually the foreign trips, I did all the advance work on my own. So here we go. Who's a guy who should know better? And yet Kennedy is a sitting duck in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And there's no exaggeration. It's not like looking through 2014 eyes backwards. It's just looking at the security that was invoked during 1961 and 1963, we can get into that. We can compare trips and go through all the gory details. But, again, you talk about the guy who was the chief architect and left Kennedy to die. There you go. And, and Floyd Boring, if I get specific, okay, but what did he specifically do? What he specifically did is he denied Kennedy coverage on or around his limousine. He created this fable that President Kennedy ordered the agents off the car turns out not to be true. In fact, that's the chapter one of my book explores this in detail where these gentlemen are all telling me and writing her on the phone and, and even on tape, and it's a landslide of truth, I call it. They're all saying President Kennedy was a very nice man, never interfered with our actions at all. Oh, he never ordered us off the car. Surprisingly, one of the gentlemen was none other than Floyd Boring himself. His 1976 JFK Library oral history only came out in 1999 because of myself and Bill Adams contacted the JFK Library and said, you know, Floyd Boring was interviewed. You guys going to do anything with the transcript? They released it, and inside the transcript, he's saying of all the presidential administrations he dealt with, LBJ, or I'm sorry, uh, FDR to LBJ, the JFK administration was the most cooperative. So there's not even anything in, in any of those paperwork to say, oh, he's saying that JFK ordered him off the car. Well, t for your listeners out there, here's what happened. Okay, the official story was Oswald acted alone and Jack Ruby acted alone. And so some people were raising the question, some people were saying, well, wait, how come Kennedy was such a sitting duck? And what alleviated the situation for everybody was this myth that, well, President Kennedy didn't want the agents by the car. He didn't want the motorcycles by the car. He didn't want the bubble top on the car. He wanted the trademarks, the, you know, the, the women's building for the speech site. And so that got the onus off the Secret Service. They said, well, the president, God bless him, he's, he's dead. But, you know, maybe he had it coming. He had a rendezvous with death. He didn't want these things done. And so when you realize it's not true and the onus was not the Secret Service and they were lying about it, well, that looks pretty bad, doesn't it? And it gets down to the, you know, whether it's gross negligence, it's following orders, who specifically laid out the order, and, and the onus is totally on Floyd Warren. And Let's on, dive uh, into Daily Plaza for a second. Now, one of the sure. comments in the movie JFK, uh, one of the uh, comments made by Fletcher Prouty was that there was a lot of open windows and the Secret Service wouldn't have allowed that. However... In my own research, and you can correct me on this if you want, Vince, I have found multiple pictures when he was in Ireland. JFK was in Ireland. Right. Even mm -hmm. when he was here in Canada, um, he was virtually sitting on the back of his limousine, wide open. People were hanging, virtually hanging out windows, waving to him. Is Do you feel that part of right. those open windows is relevant, or do you think it's just something that, you know oh. what, maybe he, Fletch was wrong on that one? No, actually, Fletch was right about that. Here's the story okay, on that. Sure. Yes. Yep. Yeah, this is This is why sometimes pictures and even to a lesser extent newsreels, sometimes they can lie sometimes. You, you see a still photo, and it looks like Kennedy's a sitting duck because the car's not moving. You're seeing open winners, and you're going, oh, wow, well, look at this. A still photo doesn't show the speed of the limousine and also does not show that President Kennedy normally had the Secret Service or the military or the police guarding rooftops. This was standard procedure before Dallas. This is not hyperbole. It's not just every once in a while. 
I found through contemporary newspaper articles, and this is through interviews, documents, it's in the book, I found a lot since the book, too, that I have on my blog, that this was standard procedure. And again, in Ireland, they had, this is again, this is, this is in the book and on my blog, they had reports of snipers. So they had policemen with binoculars on the rooftops of the major buildings, as well as Secret Service agents on President Kennedy's limousine as well. So they had men with binoculars on the rooftops. So that was covered. It was them, and the buildings were checked themselves. So again, there you go. There's your answer. Sometimes people do the gotcha game. It's only human nature. I would, I'd be the same way too, playing devil's advocate and say, well, hey, Vince, you can't use 2014 security. I say to himself, don't. Just use 61 to 63 security. Kennedy would have lived. And that's a very good uh, counter argument. Some people try to throw my way. And they say, well, what if Vince, look at these pictures. I don't see uh, agents beside the car. I, don't, I see open windows. And what they don't see, again, it, again, the, the trip before Dallas, when he went to Florida, Mm -hmm. Major buildings were all guarded by the sheriff's department. The police and or the military lined the street and faced the crowd. The car was going at a fast clip. You had agents on the back of the limousine. It's, I mean, go, I'll, the list goes on, and I'll gladly go through this. But, again, that was this is how they did it. The Secret Service back in 1963 was a small organization. They only had roughly about 350 agents, and they only had roughly about yeah, 35 to 40, give or take, in the White House detail. So what they did to alleviate the situation is they used the local police, the sheriff's department, Texas Rangers, and I can't you know, Texas, they'd use Texas Rangers, or they would use some branch of the military. And what they would tell those guys to do is to line the street, face the crowd, don't face the vehicles, face the crowd, and also line the buildings. And this is the, this is the big one here. Chief Inspector Michael Torina, mm -hmm. he wrote the Secret Service manual. I spoke to the gentleman twice. And I was very curious because a 1962 book for young adults came out. It was called What Does a Secret Service Agent Do? And there was a flat statement in the book. And Michael Trina wrote the book with Chief Riley. It says, whenever the president is to appear in a parade, agents or police are to guard buildings. So I was like, wow, this is incredible. It's a year for the assassination. Is that hyperbole? Is it only for inaugurals in D.C.? So I ran it by uh, Mr. Michael Trina, who wrote the manual, and he said to me, well, that was, yeah, that was Stan Proceed. That's why I was in the book. He wouldn't elaborate. He wouldn't add on to what the statement is. He said, that statement stands. What was in that book, I went to a lot of detail with Chief Riley on the book. And, again, this is the gentleman who wrote the Secret Service manual. So this isn't conspiracy theories. They normally did guard the buildings. Let's go back up the ladder for a second and go back to Emery Roberts, sure. um, who was a Secret Service agent. Who was pulling his strings? Because, obviously, I don't think the complexity – of the scenario that you've just laid out for us, I don't think Emery Roberts could have accomplished all he did without somebody higher up pulling the strings and perhaps persuading others to fall in line with Emery Roberts. Correct. Yeah, you know what, I, again, okay, to answer your question directly to name names and, and, and stand behind it, well, Bill Greer, Floyd Boring, and Emery Roberts, that's three gentlemen. They controlled how everything else went that day in Dallas because you got the planner of the Texas trip, the driver of the limousine, and the gentleman who controlled the agents in the car behind Kennedy. Everybody else is just following orders. It's a matter of – and everybody else is basically gross negligence. The gentleman will just following orders. You can't really cast too much aspersions on them. These gentlemen, these three, did what they did because in the short answer is they were disgusted with President Kennedy's private life, and the long answer is – they wanted a Texan in the White House. They wanted somebody tough on communism, not soft on communism. They didn't want uh, African Americans to rule the roost in America the way it looked like in their eyes. They didn't like the America that John F. Kennedy was giving them. They didn't like the way they thought he soiled the presidency through his reckless personal life. And they let it happen. And I think they just thought it was good for the country. And it was basically they wanted, you know, J. Edgar Hoover. Vice President, soon to be President Lyndon Johnson, and a handful, again, we're talking like two or three gentlemen, either current, then current, or then former uh, CIA agents like Alan Dulles and Ford Meyer. It just took that small handful of people, mm -hmm. action through an action. It wasn't so much what the Secret Service did, ladies and gentlemen, it's what the Secret Service did not do. For a few precious seconds, hey, we got changing, okay, that's a shame, we got a new president, now well, we got to protect. And secretly, there was probably a little gleam in their eye because mission accomplished. We have a guy in here who's going to um, not, uh, you know, back away from Southeast Asia. He's not going to give these ends, you know, the N-words, yeah. yeah. civil yeah. rights, et cetera, et cetera. 
And, and that, that's it's obscene, it's terrible, it's awful, but I really do believe my heart of hearts that's what happened. And that also solves it for me as far as, oh, come on, man, see, Secret Service agent as an institution couldn't have been involved. Of course not. Oh, come on, these gentlemen worked for a small amount of money. They were loyal. They were patriotic. Of course, but also leads them wide open to blackmail, wide open to being uh, persuaded and, and seeing, too, you know, Lyndon Johnson was like a man's man, and they saw the way he would have ruled things, and, and also I just think that they just saw an opportunity, a golden opportunity in Texas. To, was know. there a backlash against Johnson? Was he in danger of being hit because he brought in the civil rights legislation? Um, I think at that time it was basically – it was it was too entrenched at that time. I think that they realized he couldn't uh, fight City Hall. I think that um, with the uh, you know the trauma of President Kennedy's assassination, Congress enacted all a lot of that legislation due to you know as a tribute to JFK. I think that nothing's black and white. I think that it was basically you're going to take the good with the bad, and some of the bad in their eyes was going to be you know some of President Kennedy's you know held up legislation was going to pass. One of the ones being the civil rights, but you know just like. Lyndon Johnson said it's you know it's a JFK movie. Just you know, get me elected, I'll give you your damn war. Yes. And it's the way you know the, the morals, the kind. Now, ironically, Lyndon Johnson wasn't exactly a moral man either, and he wasn't exactly faithful to Lady Bird either. So that's the irony of ironies here. But the bottom line is, it is what it is. Vince, uh, we've got a, a phone call from sure. uh, my friend Bill from Lake Tahoe. Bill, do you have a question for Vince? Yes. Hi, Vince. Uh, pleasure to meet you. I was. Oh, and, Brent, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you, my friend? Good, real good. Good. Um, I was reading, uh, and, and Brent had uh, uh, David Lipton on last week mm, and yes. on his show, and I had, was rereading some of the, his chapters the other day. And do you think that the FBI had any indication uh, that uh, Bill Greer was involved in this? Because uh, in David's book, he, he said an interesting thing happened that uh, Siebert and um, O'Neill uh, mm -hmm. uh, went, uh, went to the Secret Service uh, the following week to interview uh, Bill Greer, and he said that he actually, they actually took down a description. Yes. Oh, did you get oh, cut sorry. off that description? Yeah. Just, uh, so my, uh, my, uh, my question was, do you think that at some point in time they, they thought that uh, he was involved in this? Yes, the short answer is yes, and that's also, uh, and I give tribute to uh, David Lipton on that score. Yeah, it's a great part of his fantastic book, and, and yeah, there's, I, I definitely think that they definitely viewed him as a suspect. There's no doubt, that's short order. I mean, it's basically, with the combined White House detail at that time, because it was obviously JFK's agents and Lyndon Johnson's agents, we're talking now 50-plus agents of the White House detail, and they're taking down Bill Greer's complete age, height, color of eyes, color of hair. They didn't do it to anybody else they interviewed, anybody else they sought out. When um, Francis X O'Neill in 1992 was asked about that, he was very evasive and didn't answer. Basically, said, "Well, we just wanted some more information," and then didn't go into any details why, who told him to do that, because he just didn't want to you know, expand upon what he what he had. But I think at the time they were very suspicious, and why they were, because that night at the autopsy. Bill Greer and Roy Kellerman were telling some whoppers to the uh, to Siebert and you know, the FBI. That was going back to Hoover. And some some of the whoppers were Bill Greer after the assassination. They got to Parkland Hospital. Was very remorseful as Kenny O'Donnell, Dave Powers, and others that noted. He said, "Oh, if only I would have sped up in time. Oh, if only I would have saw it in time." And he gets to the morgue and he's telling the FBI, "Well, you know, sometimes President Kennedy ordered us to slow down. You know, like throwing the onus on Kennedy. The old blame the victim trick." As for Roy Kellerman, he said an absolutely obscene thing to the FBI. It is so – I usually end my talks with this because it gets the audience to go wow and disgust. He told the FBI that the advanced security arrangements of the Dallas trip were the most stringent and thorough ever in the history of the Secret Service. They were awful. It was actually the worst. And he's sitting there telling the FBI it was the best. And again, that's by 1963 standards, by trips he just had the day before in San Antonio, a few days before in Florida. The list goes on. It's yeah. obscene. Yeah. Good morning as well. Vince, I, I want to ask you just, just one quick question, Bill, and then I'll let you ask another no question. Um, 
we were talking extensively about William Greer, who's the driver of the limousine that Kennedy was in, and he right. slowed down. There's a big rumor on the Internet. I want to uh, blow this one apart right now, that Bill Greer turns around with a gun in his hand and shoots Kennedy. <laughs> Stupid. Totally asinine. Not Thank true you. at all. Dumb. But, but what it does, it, 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 it creates a smoke screen, pardon the pun, because what the truth is he fired the figurative bullets because even people like Gerald Posner and Vince Bugliosi say that he's success, he's he's responsible for the successful you know the successful nature of the assassination because by not speeding up by not listening to Roy Kellerman Roy Kellerman even told William Manchester Greer then looked in the back of the car maybe he didn't believe me and that's what and, and when Bill Greer talks to the Warren Commission he denies all this I, I never saw President Kennedy oh, I hit the gas right away and you know, all this BS but. Do you answer any questions out there? You might say, well, come on, Vince. Why would Greer do this? Well, here's a story on that. Bill Greer died in 1985. In 1991, I sought out his son. His, his, uh, Bill Greer's wife passed away a number of years ago. He only had one son, Richard. And I asked him, well, what did your father think of President Kennedy? There was deadly silence, nothing. So I went on some other innocuous questions, and I went back to it. I said, well, Mr. Greer, you know, Richard Greer, what did your father think of President Kennedy? He said, well, we're Methodists. JFK was Catholic. And before you can digest that even more, it turns out that Bill Greer was born and raised in Connie Tyrone Ireland, only come to this country at the age of 19. As we know, for generations, for centuries, the, you know, the Protestants and the Catholics have been doling in bloody war. So for Bill Greer to have conveyed that to his son, and a total stranger on the phone being me, he's telling me, well, we're Methodists, JFK was Catholic. That looms large for what did and did not happen in Dallas. And I also, in another thing, another one of my major discoveries, if I do say so myself, a month before the assassination, an agent died at Camp David. So all these mystery that. deaths, yeah, and it, what, what, he could have drove Kennedy in Dallas, Tom Shipman. We'll glad, I'll gladly get into that for you. Sure, go yeah. ahead, please, and then we'll get Bill's question in right after that. How's that, Bill? Okay. Yeah, no, he, okay, yeah, in the interest of time, yeah, again, this was a late discovery. We're not talking in the 60s or 70s or 80s. This came about in 1999, came across an obscure book, A Million Miles of Presidents, by George McNally. He was the head of the White House Signal Corps that handled you know, radio traffic and whatnot. Mm -hmm. He was a former agent during the FDR and Truman days. Well, anyway, he wrote this manuscript. It only came out in 1982. gentleman passed away in 19... There's a point to all this, trust me. He, he passed away in 1970. His widow came out with it in 1982. And even then, it was just a Kinko's cut-and-paste, stapling type of deal. It wasn't any kind of book you get in the bookstore, but I got a, a hold of a copy. And other people out there probably have seen it by now. But anyway, in the unindexed copy of the book, on like page 150-something or other, it says Thomas Shipman, one of the president's drivers, died suddenly. And again, uh, there's a point to this. I'm going to go further than just that detail. In 1999, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, wait a minute. An agent of the Secret Service died. I've never heard this before. He died about roughly a month before the assassination. What is this? I've never heard anyone. Camp David, it's bizarre. Hey, yeah. Camp David. Well, it gets worse. Again, only, again, only because of me. I mean, it is what it is. Um, back in the mid to late 90s, this former agents association, still going strong now, called the AFA USSS, has a roll call of all the agents that passed away. They didn't have him listed or several other agents listed until I started to ask questions. And all of a sudden, they updated it. They said October 14th. 1963, anybody who dies, they can Google it right now. October 14, 1963, Thomas B. Shipman died of a heart attack while on duty at Camp David. And this is crazy because he's one of Kennedy's drivers. He just drove Kennedy a number of trips before Dallas, including to the uh, Pinchot, Mary Pinchot Myers State in Milford, mm -hmm, PA. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I get, it gets pretty deep there, too. A fifth secret service agent dies. Well, I found nothing in newspaper articles until an associate of mine, a wonderful lady, Deb Gallantine, came across an article just early last year, just in time for publication of my book. It was an obscure newspaper, and it says that he died. N not even two days later, he's buried. The coroner says a heart attack, but that's a standard line to give. There's no toxicology test. Toxicology tests take weeks. Why would they just bury him two days later and give the, the old catch-all heart attack? Very strange. It's even stranger because I've I scoured all the uh, newspaper articles. There's nothing from Pierre Salinger or JFK himself, and yet ten years later, when an agent died for Nixon, Nixon was was weeping. And he gave his condolences to his family. Trisha and his wife attended the funeral. There's nothing from the Kennedys about the death of this man, and it looms large for a month later because here's Bill Greer, who I think was purposely inept, 
and then it could have been Shipman if he didn't die. And this isn't a death after the fact that people were extrapolating, you know, sinister motives to. This is the gentleman who died a month before, and I'm very dubious that he died of a heart attack. He's the only agent, just like Emory Roberts, is the only agent to ever be in an apolitical function as an appointment secretary to a president. Well, Thomas Shipman is the only agent to ever die at Camp David, and there was only 34 agents that ever died in the line of duty up to that, but basically in the early millennium. I think it might be a couple more since. Okay. Thousands of agents, and Thomas Shipman's one of them. So. Let's go back to Bill with his question. Thanks, Bill, for hanging on there. Sure. No, that was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Vince, there were probably over 60 witnesses in Daly Plaza that reported that the limousine actually stopped. Now, yes. you know that there is a a big uh, conspiracy theory uh, that the Zapruder film uh, has been altered uh, because you don't see any stoppage of the limousine in the Zapruder film, although you do see it slow down some. But there are there are dozens of people that actually indicated that that limousine stopped. In your interviews with any of the Secret Service agents, did any of them ever uh, uh, indicate that the limousine actually stopped? Actual stop? No, more like just like a slowdown. And uh, Walt Coughlin was on the Texas trip, wasn't in Dallas, said, well, you know, Greer did what he did. Someone else could have done worse. Which is almost like a comical response to that, but that's what he said. So most of them just said slow down, wouldn't say a dead stop. Actually, ironically, you're quoting from um, an article I wrote called 59 Wizards. 59 witnesses delay on Elm Street. I compiled all the um, witnesses that said the limousine there slowed down or stopped. And, Bill, to get to your question exactly what I think, I'm an agnostic on the situation about the Zabruder film, whether it was altered or not. Um, I lean towards that there's a possibility splices, films could have been removed, so maybe some a conservative viewpoint about whether the film itself you know, was um, altered. But what I do think is I think the slowdown was so dramatic some people viewed it as a stop, but it didn't really stop. It just slowed down. And the bottom line, that's against common sense, secret service protocol. Bill Greer lied about it to the Warren Commission, even to the High Select Committee in private interviews, never admitted seeing the president ever. And yet here he is. He's looking, right? Anybody with common sense can view that film. It's not like the Rodney King film where you get a little wiggle room and said that he had it coming. I mean, there's no doubt that Bill Greer is looking right at Kennedy. I mean, it insults our intelligence to say otherwise. And this new film that came out that we can see um, on Main Street, uh, they're all turning around and looking at JFK when JFK's having a little chat of Governor Connolly about something here and there. They're turning back around for a few seconds here and there. There's no doubt that this happened. And, and the obscene thing is, again, most people believe there's a conspiracy, but I always throw it out to the few people in the room that think Oswald acted alone. The tragedy is if these gentlemen would have did what they did, normally Kennedy would have lived. So, you know, this thing about who killed Kennedy, I think it's a Secret Service, that even just by default, whether it's a sinister thing or not. And, yes, 60 people said that the limousine either slowed down or stopped. So it's a landslide, again, of, of this, you know, what these people witnessed. It's, you know, even in the JFK movie, it's, you know, the actress playing Gene Hill said, mm -hmm. that limousine dr driver stopped. I don't know what was wrong with that, you know, limousine driver. I mean, so it's it's been out there little, you know, little bits and pieces, you know, to the public, but. In, in large part, people don't go beyond the Secret Service. They look at the, you know, the, the ghosts on the grassy knoll and yeah. go into other things and don't go to... You know, I can give you a lot more, too. I can do a comparison of other trips, anything you want to do. I can, Just let me yeah. tell the folks who we're speaking with, folks, I'm glued to the seat tonight. This is fantastic. Uh, Vince Palama, Palamara is with us. Uh, this book is called Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service, and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. And we're going to be getting into a lot more in the second hour as well, as well as Abraham Bolden, folks, who was the first African-American Secret Service agent, handpicked by JFK himself. Handpicked yeah. by JFK himself. And, oh, fantastic, man. What a human being. What an inspiration. What an incredible man. Uh, I've interviewed him several times. And you can chapter find those. In my book. Yeah, he's pictured in my book, Chapter 17. is dedicated to him. And a lot of, I corresponded and spoke to Abraham many times. Great, oh. great. What a wonderful yeah. human being, isn't he? Triple W dot Nightfright Show, folks dot com. By the way, um, the archives are there for you. You can download them for free. Make a donation while you're there, so I can put food on the table. My God, um, Triple W dot Nightfright Show. Click on Vince's book as well. Order his book. It's it's going to look great on your library. And if you're interested at all in the Kennedy assassination, this is a great book. 
book to add to the collection. It'll give you some facts that you didn't know. I'm learning a lot tonight myself, and um, it'll give you a lot of stuff to look at and think in a different direction, and that's what's great about a book like Vince has put out. Um, let's go back a second here. Now, I wanted to talk about a fellow who I thought was the only hero on the Secret Service team that particular day, and that's a fellow by the name of Clint Hill. Mm -hmm. yes. Can we talk a little bit about Clint Hill? Oh, yes. We can talk a lot about Mr. Hill. Okay. Fact, Fire away. Yeah. To your audience out there, and again, I stress this. This is not ego. This is this is largely by default. I admit a self-deprecating remark here. I'm just an amateur out in the woods that started out with just an interest in this, and it was little old me out in the wilderness that discovered some things, and, and one of the things leading to Clint Hill directly, you know, as people are interested in him is, well, this gentleman at the time, basically the mid-millennium, like 2005, was roughly in his late 70s. He had no plans of writing a book or coming above board, other than his 60-minute interview in 1975, very poignant interview with Mike Wallace, and a couple other bits and bobs. That was basically it for Clint Hill. And it was lived in a mystery, shrouded in an enigma. Basically, oh, Clint Hill, he's the only one who did anything that day. I wonder whatever it became of that gentleman, so on and so forth. Well, I, I took the bold move. Um, Lynn Meredith, one of his colleagues, uh, former agent on the White House detail, he guarded the Kennedy children spe specifically, uh, gave me quite a coup. Uh, in early 2005, he gave me Clint Hill's unlisted address and phone number. Can't stress this enough. No private researcher ever got to, through to Clint Hill before. Other than William Manchester that was sanctioned by Jacqueline Kennedy. By Jackie. Other than uh, uh, Mike Wallace, because that's Clint Hill wanted to vent after he retired from the Secret Service. Basically, that was it. And so I was bold enough at the time in 2005 to send this gentleman a 22-page letter. It was basically a Cliff Notes of my book in progress. And it basically said in the letter, in interest of time, 22 pages, it basically said, Clint, God bless you, at least you tried. Well, if it wasn't for your colleagues hamstringing anybody's bizarre orders and blaming it on Kennedy, I think you would have been able to do your job better, and it's not your fault, it's your supervisors, a couple you know, gentlemen that I named earlier, and so on and so forth. Well, he wasn't too thrilled about that, to put him out when I called him about a couple days later. Well, the point of all this is, Three books, basically, yeah, is it three books. The Kennedy Detail, Mrs. Kennedy and Me, and Five Days in November have come out in the last several years. You can blame me, Vince Palomero, for these books ever seeing the light of day. What happened was my 22-page letter was basically a figurative bomb in the lives of Clint Hill, Gerald Blaine, his best friend, and several other colleagues. Turns out Gerald Blaine had known um, – Clint Hill, since the late 50s, they served the Denver field office. For your audience, Gerald Blaine is a former agent who wrote mm -hmm. the book called The Kennedy Detail. Oh, yeah, well, we'll I get into to, that, too, in the second hour. Yes, definitely. Um, just an interesting time uh, about Clint Hill. And that's when, all of a sudden, I started reading these things. He's writing a book. He's teamed up with Lisa McCubbin, so on and so forth. And then, to my shock and dismay, I read his book, and I'm reading Gerald Blaine, and they're trying to throw the blame back on Kennedy when these gentlemen told me something totally different. Gerald Blaine told me on two different occasions. President Kennedy was a very nice man, very cooperative, did not order them off the car. And this thing about the Ivy League charlatans, this, this thing that originated with Floyd Boring, that supposedly in Tampa, sounds great. It's great, great script. Hollywood movie script, even though it's not true. And supposedly JFK turned around and said, get these Ivy League charlatans off the back of my car, which makes us no sense because JFK's from the Ivy League. Why would he denigrate people from the Ivy League and say, get these men off my car? Uh, but anyway, that was the genesis of it all. And, and the thing about Clint Hill was he was one of the agents, one of nine agents that drank the night before. Yes, you know the Cartagena in Columbia scandal from two years ago, President Obama. President Obama wasn't even there. Yeah, we had a scandal where these men were drinking and having sex parties and whatnot. That's well, right. lo and behold, the night before a president's killed, Clint Hill is one of the nine agents drinking, staying out late, sleep deprivation, alcohol consumption. It's, it's, it's a Secret Service manual that was reprinted in Volume 18 of the Warren Commission. It's grounds for removal from the Secret Service. But guess what? Everybody loves a hero. And 63 and 64 were a very naive country before Woodward Burns, before the Vietnam War became a war in and of itself. People wanted to go on. They didn't care about the details, and they wanted a hero. Clint Hill fit the bill. He at least attempted to do something, and he was not a split second late. He was, in the big scheme of things, he was late. The assassination was over and done with by the time he got the car. Uh, you know, Jackie Kennedy got in and out of her own volition. They never even touched, you know, it, it, Clint Hill was reached not to her, but she got in and out of her own accord. She was getting a back piece of the president's head to blown off. 
Clint Hill was gave it, given an award that, to his credit. He's never really accepted in his heart because he knows better. He's never really acknowledged the drinking incident, but it's documented. There's no doubt he was one of the participants. Okay. And, and then he rose to become assistant director of the Secret Service. Before that, he was the head of the uh, Johnson Detail briefly, so who benefits and whatnot. But these gentlemen were out there, and they were basically – Clint Hill was always like the spokesman, so to speak, for the Kennedy Detail. He was the one who was always out there. Most people always used him as a little uh, catch-all. It's like, oh, Vince, come on. These gentlemen, these guys are patriarch. Look at Clint Hill. He tried to do something. But the thing is, people got to realize that's all well and good. But as a current agent has told me, of course, the anonymity can still serve. Of course. That, yeah, these, these agents, they're not looking for awards. They're not looking for their names in the paper. Their job, their single function, other than guarding you know, uh, the currency, their, their number one function, especially when the White House detail, is to guard the life of the president. They're supposed to do anything and everything to do that, and not to drink the night before, have sex parties, stay out late this, that, and the other, and to blame the president after the fact for their own uh, wrongdoing. It's just obscene. And I hate to say it because I might ruffle some feathers out there, but uh, Clint Hill, he's laughing all the way to the bank. He doesn't care about me. And now he's at two... Uh, you don't people. think he suffers, though? You don't think What's he that? suffers with survivor's guilt? Uh, a coin I, of I, phrase. I think he did for a while. I think he truly did. But I think what, um, quote-unquote, exonerated him from those feelings was, I hate to say it, I think it was a second childhood. It was a second uh, second life, so to speak, with the last few years of the book. I mean, again, and I'm saying this. This is based on fact. This isn't supposition. This isn't TMZ. This is just honest-to-God truth, and it's out there. It's the Clint Hill's own voice and whatnot. He is in a relationship now with his co-author, Lisa McCubbin, mm-hmm. and she's the co-author of all these books. As a lady is young enough to be his daughter, it is what it is. They made a, a ton of money, a ton of money off these books. There's a movie deal in the works. And again, three major bestsellers on the biggest publishing company in the world. And, and, and need we say more. It's a second, you know, he's basically hoodwinked a lot of the public that doesn't want to hear these things, doesn't want to believe this stuff. You know, the average person out there that wants to move on, maybe they believe in a conspiracy. To them, it ruffles the feathers to even say, come on, these gentlemen, they were there to protect the president. How dare you say these things? And Clint Hill, he tried to do something. They don't want to get in. It, it does, Did it Clint ever up. address his drinking the night before? Because many oh. agents hadn't even been to bed. Yeah, he was he was livid. He didn't want to, he wouldn't, didn't want to talk about it. Mm. He was he was madder. I've never heard. Uh, say, it's like his veins are popping out of his neck. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him. And then here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Again, I can't stress this enough. These gentlemen, were and they were not going to write a book. It wasn't coming out. And then Gerald Blaine, his best friend, was quoting from my private letter to Clint Hill when I spoke to Gerald Blaine two days later. I realized, wow, when I saw the press release saying that Gerald Blaine's coming out with a book, I started to realize, oh, my gosh, they're going to do it, aren't they? They're going to throw Kennedy under the bus. And sure enough, it said JFK, who banned the agents from his car. That was one of the, the headlines of the upcoming book, The Kennedy Detail. And when I read it, oh, I just couldn't believe yeah, it. Yeah, we know that's not true because Mr. Bolden, Abraham Bolden folks, told me that uh, Mr. Kennedy was very, very cooperative with the Secret Service and his protection. Don't forget, Mr. Kennedy was a family man. He uh, was a father. He was a husband. Uh, he had two little kids at home who we absolutely adored. Ted Sorensen, who I interviewed, told me that he adored those kids more than anything else in his life. Absolutely what? loved them. Uh, we're going to be coming up to a break in about a minute and a half, so I just want to set up the next hour, Vince. Vince, can you stay with us for the next hour? Oh, gladly, sure. Thank you. Obviously, Roger Stone. I don't know what happened. Uh, sometimes there's glitches, folks, with publishers. Uh, publishers say, yeah, he's they're booked, <laughs> and then they're not. <laughs> they're out there somewhere. So we'll try and reschedule Roger Stone for a later date. I would definitely like to have him on the show. Uh, seems like a very interesting character. Uh, our guest tonight, though, more importantly, I'm learning a lot, and I'm really enjoying this, Vince Palomara, Survivor's Guilt. The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. That's the name of his book, www.nightfrightshow.com. And you can get his book there just by clicking on the book cover. In the second hour, Abraham Bolden we're going to be looking at. And uh, what an incredible human being, folks. Stick around for this because this is a real American hero. And I'm not kidding. You will not be disappointed. He was the first African-American Secret Service agent handpicked by JFK himself, and I would go as far as saying if Mr. Bolden was on duty that day, 
the world would be different because President Kennedy wouldn't wouldn't have died. Mr. Bolden may have, but President Kennedy would still be with us. And I'm I just agree. waiting. Go ahead, please, Vince. Oh, just say an interesting time. I agree with everything you said. Very good summary, Brent. And just just want to quickly say after the break. I'll get into the details of uh, what should have happened in Dallas and what you usually did on previous trips, so we'll That's do that. great. That's perfect. Ah, there's the music, folks. So, Vince, stick with us six minutes, um, about two minutes after 8 o'clock. Go for a pee break if you have to. Did I just say that on air? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has to do these things, folks. <laughs> get the coffee going, get the tea going, get a beverage of your choice going. Stick around for that second hour because, man, this is electric tonight. See you in a few minutes, folks. You hear that, folks? I bring my own fans. <laughs> Except my fans go around in a circle, I think. It's a joke. It's a fan joke, fanboy joke. Folks, welcome back tonight, Fred. I'm your host, Brent Holland. Welcome, everybody, back. Get the coffee going. Get the tea going. Get a beverage of your choice going. Still got a good full hour left with an incredible guest tonight. Vince Palomara, he's got a book out. We're discussing JFK again, and as I said at the outset of last our show nobody covers the jfk assassination or any of the three assassinations in the 60s like night fright and that's something i'm very very proud of uh, i try to bring as many guests in on this subject as possible to put the information out there for you and you decide for yourself what happened that day and that's what it's all about the survivor's guilt the secret service and the failure to protect President Kennedy, we're looking at the Secret Service lack of coverage on that presidential trip to Dallas, November 26th, 1963. Um, just before we go back to Vince, I was going to ask Vince about the bubble top. Now, what is your opinion of the bubble top being on or off the car? Vince, are you there, my friend? Okay, oh. well, uh... oops. You seem to be cutting in and out. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay, buddy. Yeah. What's your opinion of the bubble top? Okay. Well, yeah, I devote Chapter 3 to my book on that. And President Kennedy, a fair amount of time, roughly about 20 different trips, he used the bubble top either in a partial or full um, configuration. And this was in good weather conditions. He also used it when it rained, but that doesn't count because, obviously, you know, he's just using it because it's raining. But against myth, there's a myth out there. He only used it in inclement weather, but he actually used it in some bright, sunshiny days, and he used it when it was in a partial formation, meaning the front and rear pieces were on the car, but the middle piece was left open to get some, you know, air and be able to, you know, stand every once in a while. Now, while that bubble top was not bulletproof in the traditional sense of the word, it was something that I think would definitely would have deflected a bullet. Um, about a dozen agents in my book even admit so. that The bubble top was a deterrent, they said, because it definitely would either deflect a bullet, or here's another thing, too. The sun's glare off the bubble top would obscure an assassin's view. And finally, as I even say, it was a psychological deterrent. Would an assassin or assassins even ventured a shot, because they'd see the bubble top on, they'd say, abort, abort, he's got the top on. Because the conventional wisdom was it was bulletproof. Most people thought it was bulletproof to the point a couple agents even said it was bulletproof when it wasn't. They were in error. But the point being is the general public believed it to be so. And if it was on the car, again, even if this, the rear piece was on with the front piece, that was a common configuration. Going through the, the tremendous archives of um, films and photos, again, I discovered JFK only had a finite number of motorcades from 1961 to 1963. He didn't go on a motorcade every day of the month. Right. He only went on a select few you know, each year, just because he had a short presidency, you know, less than three years. I mean, other than Washington, D.C. trips, we're talking, you know, scattered, memorable trips to Ireland, Germany, you know, Canada, et cetera, et cetera. And a fair amount of domestic trips. And, again, just combing the archives, I was very pleasantly surprised that, wow, he's using the bubble top roughly about 20 different trips and in good weather. And when I spoke to Bob Lilly, one of the many agents I spoke to, um, was a member of the White House details, oh, yeah, in fact, we had the bubble top on the car down there in Venezuela – we were going roughly 50 miles per hour, and Roy Kellerman and I were holding on to the back of the car, and there was no rain in sight. They just had the bubble top on, again, as a deterrent. So to answer your implicit question in there, would it have made a difference in Dallas? Yes. And the, here's the funny thing is the bubble top was originally on the car. That's right. It was taken down. Now, it was blamed on Kennedy, but here's the thing. 
Sam Kenny, the driver of the fob car, I spoke to him three times. He was adamant to me. I mean, he was so forceful. If he was acting, he deserves an Academy Award. He was adamant to me that he was solely responsible for the bubble top's removal. He said Kennedy had nothing to do with it. O'Donnell had nothing to do with it. No other agent had anything to do with it. It was his sole decision to remove the bubble top. He said, it's something I have had to live with for 30 years. Keep in mind, this is early 90s. He told me this. So, yeah, 30 years I had to deal with. I decided if we were there, I'd probably do it all again, you know, because we've been too tough to uh, put the top back up. It came in six pieces and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So it's a little convoluted answer for you, but it was definitely an option that was not explored. I don't think it's necessarily sinister, per se, that it wasn't on the car, but I think it was definitely, it's not the hyperbole. Some people just jump to a knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, he hardly used the bubble top. That's not true. Uh, it was a deterrent, and again, um, it was a Secret Service decision. It wasn't President Kennedy, although I could see why some people might want to blame him for that specific thing, because sometimes you have William Manchester, Jim Bishop, try to make great play of that. Again, it's all with the rendezvous of death thing. And, you know, we all have a rendezvous of death. We're not immortal, but it's all been blamed on Kennedy because it's not, it's sexy. It's, it's something that it looks good in print. And, oh, man. You know, is- Vince, I, I beg to differ with you. I'm not going. I've already decided that. <laughs> just, what? Oh, yeah. just yeah. teasing you, my friend. How about uh, Jim Lair's uh, account of why the bubble top was taken off? Now, folks, Jim Lair from the Jim Lair Report on PBS um, basically, he says that uh, he was asking in advance a Secret Service agent who was outside the limousine, with, as Vince clearly states in factual statement, the bubble top was on the roof. Um, he was he was going to he, he wanted to know if it was going to be on or off during the motorcade through downtown Dallas. And it was strictly for photographs and the television cameras covering the motorcade. So. He was being asked from people that were along the parade route from the media that were covering this event if uh, the bubble top was going to be on, and the Secret Service agent didn't know. So apparently, according to Jim Lair, the Secret Service agent called downtown to find out if it was raining. When he said, no, it's not raining anymore, the sun's just come out, that's when they decided that the plexiglass bubble top that was not bulletproof, by the way, folks, as, as Vince correctly states. Um, and apparently it was like a sauna in there. It was like an incubator when the sun was out, if they didn't have that middle section out. Uh, that's when they decided to take it off. Um, well, do you give much credit to that? Uh, I, I respect Jim Lehrer to a point, but I think there's a little bit of um – I can do a little bit of exaggeration there. Here's the bottom line. Sure. This is before, this is years before his book came out, although he did uh, briefly recount that in his book, A uh, Bus of My Own, that came out in the early 90s or late 80s, I think it was. Sam Kenny, this is an exact quote from Sam Kenny. He said, Four Sorrels, I knew him very well. He was the agent in charge of Dallas. He had nothing to do with it. I am the sole responsibility of that, you know, the removal of the top. So he is basically debunking. Jim Lair. Jim Lair, before he named the agent for Sorrels, but this previous book that just came out for the 50th anniversary, I guess he wanted the public to pretend that he never named him before. But he did name him. He said it was for Sorrels. But here's Sam Kenny telling me in 1994 adamantly that he said that four Sorrels had nothing to do with it. Kenny O'Donnell had nothing to do with it. JFK had nothing to do with it. It was his sole responsibility. And again, it's just amazing, just like when people look at Abraham Lincoln, if the guard doesn't step away for a drink at the saloon, does John Wilkes Booth it's, it's one of the many things that happened that day. But I always throw that out as a little bit of an asterisk to my work. I don't, I'm don't. i not like that hard and fast on that because I don't think it's it's necessarily sinister, although some people could try to sway it that way. I, I think Sam Kinney was one of the good guys, so I have a hard time thinking that he did that for sinister intent. But I do show in the book that it was, again, it was definitely a, a, a deterrent, would have deflected a bullet, and it was used far more than some people think. I think some people think it was only used when it rained, and that's so not true. Okay, fair enough. (laughs) Folks, uh, just joining us, hang in there because we're going to get to uh, Abraham Bolden very quickly, the first African-American Secret Service agent handpicked by JFK, not on duty that day, November 22nd, 1963. And I would argue if he was, things would be a lot different today because I think Mr. Bolden would have protected the... President of the United States, folks, that's what we're talking about, the inadequate protection that was provided by the Secret Service that day. Uh, the book is called Survivor's Guilt. Our guest is Vince Palomara, who is an expert, and he's interviewed a lot of these uh, Secret Service agents. 
that uh, were supposed to be protecting the Secret Service. Now, you had mentioned, oh, just one thing I wanted to mention, folks, and this is from my own book, which I'm going to plug, which I was told by my publisher. On your show, you should plug your book more, so here you go. <laughs> okay, Deb, if you're listening, here it is. <laughs> www.nightfrightshow.com. I have a hard time with this, folks, because for me, it's the message, not the messenger, and I have a hard time promoting my own stuff, so there you go. Uh, The book is called JFK Assassination from the Oval Office to Dealey Plaza, and the thing that sets it apart from other books is the first-person interviews I had with none other than Ted Sorensen, who was JFK's speechwriter closest aide, and as a matter of fact, it was Ted that was tasked with uh, the job of saving humanity, I would argue, that uh, he was the one that wrote that letter to Khrushchev during the missile crisis. And uh, I also inadvertently ended up with Ted's last interview on videotape. He invited me over to his apartment in New York City, and four weeks later he had passed away. Um, at which I'm turning into a full feature documentary. So I hope that's enough of a plug. Go buy the book, please. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's enough of that. Let's go back to the guest tonight. (laughs) Uh, Oh, that's good stuff, Brent, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, what were the differences between this particular trip in Dallas and all the other trips? You had mentioned that before the break, that you were going to tell us those differences. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to yeah, take off the gloves and give it to people because sometimes, sure. sometimes well, well-meaning or sometimes less well-meaning people out there sometimes try to do the gotcha game. They'll go on Google, they'll get a little item, and they'll get a still photo. Go, aha, Vince, look at this, open window, <laughs> aha, they'll see an agent's not yeah. by the car. What's your explanation for this, pal? And it is. I'll just go no further than this. Uh, first of all, we'll do a comparison to the major trip before the Texas trip, which is Florida, and we'll flesh it out from there. Okay, the Florida trip. Agents were on the rear of his limousine. That was the longest domestic motorcade President Kennedy ever had. It was like five times longer than Dallas, and agents were on the back of the car. And as Vince, we know, can I just ask you this? It just popped in my head. Sure, sure. Was this the only time that the president and vice president traveled together? Yes, in a Whoa. motorcade. That's explosive. Oh, it's in my book. It's always there's all sorts of unique things. You, it, it, blame me. <laughs> coincidence theorists are going to have a hard time explaining a lot of it. So, yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. That's one of the things in the book, yep. Mm-hmm. So, okay, but we'll get to that. Yeah, agents on the rear of the limo, and when he gets to Dallas, other than Clint Hill very briefly on Main Street, only on Jacqueline Kennedy's side, Clint Hill was a first lady agent. He wasn't a JFK agent. Uh, no agents rode on the rear of the car, and they allegedly didn't ride there by order of the president. And I have to stop there real quick. One of the major discoveries in my book is, you know, as far as, you know, the Rooftops were normally guarded, and President Kennedy had nothing to do with the agents being called away. One of the major discoveries in my book was uh, dispelling the myth that the president controls the Secret Service. By law, it's the Secret Service. As President Truman and, and President Johnson said, the Secret Service was the only boss the President of the United States really had. Chief Riley to the Warren Commission testified under oath, no president will tell the Secret Service they can or cannot do. Uh, major Associated Press story the week before the assassination that the Secret Service can overrule even the president where his personal security is involved. There's many other documented pre-Dallas statements of that in Secret Service memoirs and newspaper articles. So it's a landslide. It was the Secret Service. So even if JFK would have ordered them, they would have laughed in his face. And ironically, Clint Hill, when he did an oral history for the Sixth Floor in 2010, said, well, he could tell you what he wants to do, but what we usually did was we listened to the president, then we did what we wanted to do anyway. And that's the most truth Clint Hill ever said. So agents on the limousine. And, again, this is for the interest of time. I really want your audience to get a feel for what did and did not happen. So, again, not to belabor the point, but the agents on the rear of the car, they weren't there at Dallas. A military aide usually rode in the front seat between the driver and the agent in charge. The military aide was asked for the first time in Dallas not to ride there. The press photographer's flatbed truck rode in front of the limousine. And that normally happened all the time because they would photograph. You wouldn't need Abraham's brooder. It was canceled the last minute Love Field. Tom Dillard, one of the photographers, said, we were putting Chevrolet convertibles far back in the motorcade and put us out of the picture. The, the motorcade usually went at a fast clip. It was slow in Dallas. Again, this implies the Tampa that made a trip before Dallas. 
Floyd Boring was on the trip. The special agent in charge, Gerald Bain, B-E-H-N, or Floyd Boring, always accompanied JFK in motorcades. A third stringer, Roy Kellerman, was making his first major trip on his own. To give your audience an analogy, this would be like going to the Super Bowl and having the third stringer on the bench start the darn game instead of Tom Brady. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. And yet, you know, JFK even said, we're heading to nut country. He had the wanted for treason signs. He had the welcome to Mr. Kennedy sarcastic ad. It was just pillaring him for all these things he did not do. You had the right wing. You had the John Burr Society, the threats. And JFK even said, we're going to nut country. And he even said when he returned from Florida trip, thank God no he wanted to kill me today, Dave. And he was talking to Dave Powers when he said it. And yet we have a third stringer there. Again, like I said before, multi-story rooftops were guarded on the longest murder case JFK ever had in Tampa. He gets to one of the shorter ones in Dallas, and the rooftops aren't guarded. So even if you believe Oswald acted alone, if they would have been guarded the rooftops, history would have been averted. Obviously, I believe there's a conspiracy, so that would have been averted as well. Normally, multiple motorcycles ran next to JFK's limousine in a wedge formation. A very nice quantity of motorcycles and a quality because they were wedged around the car. All fenders. Well, for the night before, and there's even documents showing this that happened in actual testimony from police chief and the, and, the, and the assistant police chief, the Secret Service said that President Kennedy doesn't like those kind of motorcycles next to him because it interferes with the conversation. So they stripped it down to a measly four, and to add insult to injury, they weren't even riding beside the car. They were riding beside the rear wheels. They were told under no circumstances you're supposed to ride past the rear wheels of the limousine. They were ineffective. They were meaningless. It was less professional witnesses to the eventual assassination. Less gunfire could have been involved, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the White House press photographer, Cecil Stone, rode in the fall of car taking photos. He normally did this for months before, and he did the day before he gets to Dallas. And he never gave me an explanation. The gentleman passed away. I wrote him two times. He would never explain to me, explain to everything else, wouldn't say why he was not there. Pierre Salinger was normally on the trip. Um, he, he, was, he was involved in many of their... Robert Lilly told me he was involved in many of their motorcade planning and security. Again, another third stringer is making his first trip on his own. Mac killed him. Salinger even admitted he only missed one or two trips of JFK, Texas being one of them. Dr. Berkeley was normally close to the president. He, Berkeley protested at Love Field. This had only happened one time before in the three years under Kennedy. He protested. It was in Rome in July, but Rome was a tremendous security other than the fact that Dr. Berkeley wasn't next to him. Uh, normally, the military line in the street faced the crowd. The military was told to stand down that day, no military. The police normally line the streets faced the crowd. The very few police that were there did not even face the crowd. They faced the cars, the moving motorcade. They were meaningless. Um, the overpasses were to be clear of spectators. They get to Dallas. It's teeming with spectators. Ambulance was to be on standby in case of emergency. It's called away a few minutes before. And, again, it's another thing that's going to blow some people's minds. They probably think this is only modern security. And, again, it's documented in my book uh, quite a few times. A helicopter was used along the route. This happened in Nashville. This happened in Chicago. This happened in San Antonio the day before. In fact, people that watched the National Ge Geographic special, JFK, The Final Hours, this past November, they saw a helicopter view of the motorcade route. Hey, it was a hel police helicopter. There was no police helicopter on the Dallas motorcade as there was on other motorcades. So there you go. The bubble top, either partial or full, was not used. There was good intelligence on trips. Normally, in the few documents that were not sent through the Secret Service shredder, and we'll get to that in a second, 1995, showed that before the trips that they do this day, about three weeks before a trip, they have an advanced team go out, and they look for either not cases or organized conspiracy or anything in between, and they say, oh, John Jones wanted to assassinate the president. Okay, we got to get this guy to the mental hospital. we got to get him under surveillance. Oh, here's an organized plot. we got to get these guys arrested under surveillance. He gets to Dallas. And, by the way, there were six pages worth of threats in Miami, six pages worth of threats. He gets to Dallas, and allegedly there's no threats to the president. Roy Kellerman told future president, Gerald Ford, member of the Warren Commission. That was unusual. They find no threats. Abraham Bolden told me that was highly unusual, as common sense would dictate. Well, this is Chapter 2 of my book. This leads right into um, a major discovery I, I made again. It's largely by default. Glenn Bennett was one of the eight agents who rode in the follow-up car. You might say, okay, what's that mean? Well, who's Glenn Bennett? Glenn Bennett was a member of the Protective Research Section of the Secret Service. Protective Research is another word for intelligence. And what these guys did, they were administrative agents, stayed back in Washington. And back then they had uh, little uh, six-by-nine cards. 
of potential threats to presidents. And whenever a president went to Roanoke, Virginia, Philadelphia, France, anywhere around the world, they did in advance. and said, hey, again, like I said earlier, John Jones is there. We've got to investigate this gentleman. And from Secret Service testimony, again, it's all in Chapter 2 of my book, it was extremely rare, to put it mildly, that a PRS agent was ever physically on a trip. Glenn Bennett's riding in the fall car in Dallas. He's also on the Florida trip. He's also on the New York trip before Florida, all in November. And get this now. He lies under oath to the high select committee and says, I wasn't on the Florida trip. When it's a landslide of documentation shows he was in Palm Beach, Cape Canaveral, Miami, Tampa. He was also on the New York trip. He doesn't volunteer it. And guess what? The timing is beautiful. People out there probably heard of Joseph Miltier. There's really something that Joseph Miltier was played on the men who killed Kennedy with the audio tape. He says, you know, there's, there's a plot that works to kill Kennedy from an office building with a high powered rifle. That happened on November 9th, November 9th, 1963, a few weeks before the assassination. The Secret Service was much aware of that. Robert Balk, the special in charge of the PRS, even told me, oh, yeah, we knew about that before Dallas. That's not the major revelation here. The major revelation is November 10th, the next day, Glenn Bennett is temporarily assigned to the White House detail. And this is all documented in my book. This isn't ghosts and goblins and theories. It's all based on documents, interviews. It's all documented. It's like a legal brief, some of the footnotes in my book. So it's not me just making stuff out of thin air. It's, it's documented. And the bottom line is Joseph Miltier, Miltier is making this threat. This is weeks before we even knew who Oswald is or any conspiracy. And in the next day, Glenn Bennett's joining these trips. He's in the fall car. Kennedy's killed. He lies the Hacks Select Committee under oath. And those documents only came out in the late 1990s because of the Oliver Stone movie. Otherwise, they never would have saw the light of day until maybe we were 150 years old. The Secret Service in January 1995 destroyed most of the protective survey reports. It, no other agency, the FBI, the CIA, the Defense Department, nobody else did this but the Secret Service. Secret, and the ARB was, was uh, the government agency that was sponsored to look at the documents. It was highly agitated to put it mildly. They wanted to have congressional hearings and maybe some uh, criminal proceedings because the Secret Service destroyed these documents. And what it shows is if these documents would have been released, they would have shown, wait a minute now, why is President Kennedy in Philadelphia getting tremendous security? He gets the Dallas, he gets nothing. See, they didn't want those documents to the public. And likewise, when I was talking to good old Clint Hill and Gerald Blaine out in the wilderness, they didn't want this stuff to come above board. They didn't want the owners to fall back on them. It's safer to say Kennedy had it coming. He didn't want these protective procedures. But again, the outline of what I just laid out to you, the prior tip, trip in Tampa and what he normally received, 1961 to 1963, compared to Dallas, you don't have to look at a still photo. Bottom line is buildings were normally guarded. That covered the physical coverage around a car. A still photo doesn't show how fast the motorcade was going. That what really got my ire up was back in November of this past year, people might remember, it got a lot of play. They showed Nashville, Tennessee in May in 63 and said, look at the protection President Kennedy got. It was pretty, pretty putrid. That is so wrong. This is documented. The building rooftops were all guarded by the police, and they didn't move from the position until the car moved away. They guarded every major uh, stop on that motorcade, and the, the cars were going at a fast clip. A helicopter lined the rot. The police lined the rot and faced the crowd. They had good intelligence. But the news writer who wrote that article, I'd like to crucify him because he presented to the public in November, November of this past year, to say 2013, and made it look like, oh, oh see, that was, that was quaint. That's the way security was back then. And it wasn't. And, again, it, that's, that's the shocking thing. You know, you can okay, pick before I got to cut you there, because before sure. we run out of time, I want to get to Abraham Bolden. I promised sure. the crowd. So, folks, oh, if you're just one. joining us, Vince, Paul, um, Paul Amara is joining, is uh, our guest tonight. Survivor's Guilt is the name of the book, www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on tonight's guest book cover. That'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book. Now, Abraham Bolden. Fans of this show know um, I have a soft spot for, for Mr. Bolden, and, and with um, good reason. Uh, this is a, an American hero, folks. He was the first African-American Secret Service agent, uh, handpicked by JFK to be on his Secret Service detail. After the assassination, he was a whistleblower, and because of that, he was railroaded and thrown in jail for a crime he did not commit. Can you tell us your synopsis of Mr. Bolden and, and what you've come to respect with him. Oh, sure. Brent, we, you and I are 100% in agreement. Everything you said about uh, Abraham Bull Knight endorsed fully. I'm a big fan of him. He's pictured full page in 380, page 384 of my book. Chapter 17 in particular 
really fleshes out his story. Uh, back in 1993, I, I contacted the gentleman for the first time, and ever since then, countless times on the phone and writing and whatnot, we're big fans of each other's work. And this gentleman is, to me, the first whistleblower. He's the first deep throat. Everybody knows deep throat from the Watergate. You know, Mark Felt, who was the FBI agent who came out and helped Woodward words. Woodward and Bernstein take down a president. Well, um, Abraham Bolden, he's terrific. And, and, and again, documented my book in March of 63. He, he was on the protective detail that guarded Kennedy when there was a mortal threat to Kennedy's life, and he was part of the detail. Abraham Bolden knows what he's talking about. And again, another first is, again, yeah, like you said, he was the first African-American agent of the Secret Service White House detail. There was two other agents, Conrad Cross and um, Charlie Gittins, who were part of the Secret Service at the same time. But only Abraham Bolden was the first African-American agent on the White House detail. And he served very well. And he was a tremendous street agent. In fact, Bob Lilly, another agent I keep throwing out, thought highly of um, Abe, as several others did, and said he was a very good street agent. He got accommodations for um, right. you know, counterfeiting work. Very good agent. He, and he also, keep in mind now, even though he was only on the, you know, the White House detail a short period of time, that was because he was a temp. He was there for a month, and then he went back to the Chicago office and served in fine stead. And whenever the president, and this is up to and including Lyndon Johnson, came through time, he was there to provide security. And lo and behold, like I just mentioned a minute ago, March of 63, when Kennedy went to uh, Chicago, they found a mortal threat to president. And in fact, it speak helicopters, check the, the roofs of buildings at Chapter 17 of my book. And there was talk about Puerto Rican snipers and everything, totally corroborating Abe, by mm -hmm. the way. This is George McNally's book. It's in my book, too. Yeah, so it looks like there was a template in place to uh, take out the president in many cities. Yes, there's no doubt about it. It was a moving crime. It wasn't just a one-shot mm -hmm. deal in Dallas, no pun intended. It was definitely a moving crime. But Abraham Bolton was definitely there. And, and this gentleman, like I said, he, first of all, the bottom line is this. They're trying to say that he took some sort of bribe. That he was like an onion skim copy of he was going to give some sort of inside information that wasn't even inside information anyway to a gentleman he had under investigation for counterfeiting. And one of the gentlemen he arrested for this counterfeiting ring testified at Abraham uh, Bolton's trial that he admitted he perjured himself, that he had made all that stuff in the Bolden trial. And yet Bolden is still convicted, and not only is he convicted of the silliness, today, in today's world, at the worst case scenario, and I don't think Abraham Bolden did a thing wrong, I think he was framed, but even hypothetically, let's say he was found guilty, this should have been a slap on the wrist, should have been sent to a Martha Stewart prison, come out, write a memoir, be great, everything's fine, nothing to it. They treated him like he was a double murderer, for God's sake. This yeah. man was a tremendous Pinkerton detective agent, a tremendous Secret Service agent, a Illinois State uh, trooper. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole whole night he had calm. He wasn't just a regular run-of-the-mill agent. He wore it on his sleeve that he was the first hand-picked agent from a president, first African American. He wore it with uh, tremendous uh, valor because he, he won accommodations. And again, he had a, a tremendous reputation for it. Why would he do that for a handful of money? Why would he be so stupid to get involved in gentlemen he was arresting and it was involved? And, and what? And the simple answer for your audience out there is I definitely believe Maurice Martineau, who since passed away, was his boss in the Chicago office. That's right. I definitely believe that he's part of the reason why Abraham Bolden went down the, the, the uh, terrible plight that he did when it all went down. Abraham Bolden, he had that loose lips sink ship, and Abraham Bolden was very, very... Uh, touched you know he was he was traumatized when president kennedy was killed and he was not gonna hold back he remembered what happened in hyenas point where the guys were drinking on duty he, he was going to tell us to the warren commission in fact um, i have a blog a separate blog on abraham bolden called uh, abraham bolden american hero and on that i have newspaper clippings contemporary newspaper clippings from 61 62 and 63 and it talks about abraham bolden's you know his unique place in history and also it shows how when this all went down with him in 1964 he was going to testify to the warren commission the warren commission was very much interested in what he had to say then all of a sudden they changed their tune they didn't want to hear from him but at first they really wanted to, they were going to have him come to washington and testify heads were going to roll i'm telling you right now because it, imagine in 1964 if we would have learned some of these details we're only finding out in the last you know five years or so it would, it would even with a naive country I think they would have demanded a lot more from the secret I think the secret service and agency would have went under J Edgar Hoover was chomping at the bit to take over the protective uh, part and in secret service they would have existed would have just been chasing counterfeiters the, the role of governing you know protecting presidents would have went to the FBI for example was uh, Abraham Bolden was in a 
position to really take down a lot of people through facts. So what they had to do is they had to get him back. The best way to get him back was not through a little white collar thing. They had to make sure he was tainted. And so what they did, they yeah. gave him the harshest punishment, harshest facility, silliness. They put him, they acted like this man was a was a serial killer. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's obscene. And I think Maurice Smart though, his boss had a lot to do with it. You know, it, it, I agree. And, you know, you know, another black man in prison in 1963 was nothing, right, folks? Um, you know, they just railroaded him completely. As a matter of fact, the person that testified against Mr. Bolden, Mr. Bolden was accused of taking a bribe and handing over top secret, top secret, handing over documents to a fellow by the name of Spagnoli. Now, yes. Spagnoli came out and said a couple of years later after Mr. Bolden was um, – convicted of the crime he said no he said as a matter of fact uh, I'm declaring right now I perjured myself that I was set up by the Secret Service and they told me what to say and what not to say and yet and yet even with this knowledge they still wouldn't let mr. Bolden out yeah it's, it's, it's unbelievable and to this day he's fighting for uh, expulsion of his um, of, of his of his documents, um, you know they've just destroyed this man. Bobby Kennedy wanted to make him an ambassador, and he's not he wasn't allowed to do that. They just destroyed his life, and yet he never wavered, folks. He was put in a psychiatric ward in uh, the the prison, and uh, just unbelievable things were done to this man, and uh, he deserves our recognition. Without question, www.nightfrightshow.com. You will find a whole bunch of archives there. Two of them, two of them, folks. Even though I interviewed them three times, uh, two of them are on that archive uh, page for Mr. Bolden. Our guest tonight is Vince Palomara. Survivor's Guilt is the name of the book, The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. After all your research, has Anybody from the government contacted you and said, you know, Vince, we really need to get you in here to make testimony? Uh, just the opposite. I've, ah. had couple, I've had a couple of threats come my way. Actually. Oh, what, what's happened? What's happened? Yeah, not threats to my life, thank Lord, Lord knock on wood here. But, uh, yeah, back in 1992 when I first was uh, contacting these gentlemen, uh, and we're talking like some big-time people, too. We're talking about the special agent in charge of the White House detail, Gerald Bain. By the way, Gerald Bain, not to be confused with Gerald Blaine of um, the Kennedy Detail Book Bain. But Gerald Bain uh, told me, matter of factly, I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents on the back of the car. If you look at the motorcade films, you'll see agents on there. And so he's just right there. The number one agent told me Kennedy never ordered them off the car. There you go. And a host of his colleagues, well, right after I did that, about a Two days later, I got a call from Hamilton Brown, who just passed away last year, I think it was. He was the former secretary of the former Agents Association, and he called me, then he called my parents. At the time. We were, I mean, I was living on my own, but he also called my parents for good measures. I want your son. I want him to cease and desist from talking to any more of my associates. I gave him no authority to do so. And after about a scare of about an hour, because I was shocked he did this, I said, wait a minute, it's a free country. I'm calling them. They can either hang up on me or choose not to cooperate. I'm not doing anything wrong. And when I actually conveyed this to some of the agents, they said, we died and made him boss. Yeah, like, precisely. Kennedy, precisely. It's a free country. Rufus Youngblood yeah. said, hey, it's a free country. And Bob Lilly, they, they were all denigrating what he had to say. That was the first round. That was the first uh, shot across the bow. Uh, the big one was in 2009. Uh, Gerald Blaine was coming out with his book, The Kennedy Detail. It wasn't, it wasn't released yet. His lawyer sent me a letter about my blog, and it's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. I actually uh, uh, reproduced it on my blog. And it basically says that I'm trying to insinuate that I'm the co-author of Gerald Blaine's book. He says, even though the First Amendment allows freedom of speech, it does not allow for misrepresentation. We're going to have a court order to seal you from talking about these things. This is ridiculous. So, you know, I said to myself, you know what? They don't know I have my own book coming out yet, I don't think. So what I'm going to do this is say, okay, you know what, I'll take that specific blog down, no problem, sir. Well, they had the shock in their life. They thought I was going to be a fly on the wall. When my book came out this past fall, I also got harassment at work. I guess the third thing, too, I had uh, petty harassment at work, caught, got caught into human resources a few times, had silliness where they were trying to complain about my blog, saying it was un-American, trying to get me fired. In fact, the one... Um, Gerald Blaine's one friend, um, he's former military intelligence, I don't want to dignify this uh, 
person by saying his name, but uh, basically what he did, he wrote a letter to the CEO of my company to try to get me fired. Luckily, he's a CEO of the company. Never saw the letter because they have a, uh, they have a secretary that screens everything because they don't want him to see anything obscene or threatening or whatever or a complaint from a former mm-hmm. general employer or something. So the human resources people laugh at me in his advance, that you're not doing anything wrong. This person, we'll tell him, we'll, we'll, we'll set him up for harassment charges if we we'll write this again. But the point being for your audience, here we are in 2013, 2014, all these yeah. years later, and look at how scared, how worried they are. Little old me out in the woods, I'm not making, I have a day job, I work for a living, I'm making fame and fortune from all this, and yet you're so concerned about me that they're, they're trying to squelch what I have to say. They're back in 92, back in 2009, the petty harassment I had at work last year, and it would have boils down to because they knew the onus was going to be on them. It sure does. It's even seeped out in a lot of the books, like Larry Sabato, came out of his book, The Kennedy Half Century, and he duly noted my work that was, you know, in, in disagreement with Gerald Blaine, who we use as a source in his book, unfortunately, because Gerald Blaine's totally changed his tune. Gerald Blaine was adamant to be the President Kennedy, was very cooperative, never ordered mother. He, I'm just going to tell you right now, and I'm just using this based off interviews, Gerald Blaine made stuff up in his book, Whole Cloth. There was no meeting of President, by President Kennedy's orders of the day of the funeral uh, the Secret Service had a lot more on their plate. They had to guard every visiting dignitary going to St. Matthew's Cathedral. Uh, they weren't going to be talking about the dead president's alleged orders that never happened to begin with because Gerald Blaine and many of his colleagues told me President Kennedy never ordered them, but they wanted the public to see this book of Gerald Blaine and say, wait a minute, okay, it's good enough for us. President Kennedy had it coming. Okay, that's good. And they want to do that because they were afraid of my blogs, now in my book, and they don't want people to know this. They, the, the Secret Service, then and now, it's the dirty secret of the Secret Service that President Kennedy could have lived and should have lived. You now, is own? the cover-up because of their own ineptness, or you really believe that they were part and parcel to the conspiracy? I'll tell you why. Mr. Bolding says he doesn't believe that the Secret Service agents were involved. However, he does say that to a man, they say they felt that the shots came from the grassy knoll. By the way, folks, I should tell you this, too. Kenny O'Donnell and Dave Powers... Two of JFK's closest aides were in that Secret Service follow-up car. They both are on record as saying they saw the shots coming from the grassy knoll that hit President Kennedy. Um, That same Secret Service car, Mr. Bolden told me to a man, they all said the same thing as Kenny O'Donnell and Dave Powers. But he doesn't think they were complicit in any conspiracy. He thinks they were just perhaps a little hungover. a little lackadaisical, as he says, and uh, just didn't move quickly enough. Well, but you feel they were complicit in a conspiracy for sure. Three men, three men out of, three, out of as you say, Bill Greer, Henry Floyd Robert, Ward, and Floyd Henry Roberts. Okay, are my big suspects, and everybody else falls under following orders, gross negligence, or total innocence, or some variation of a theme. And I, I even go into the book in, in gory detail and flesh that all out. It needs to be because we have to name names. You know, it, the, the ghosts and goblins in the grassy knoll and the theories about who shot them, single ball theory ad nauseum. There's only so far you can go with that. I think, you know, it's 50 years later. People want evidence. People want names. If you're going to come up with these bold charges, you better have something to back it up. And uh, you know what? It, it, I do. It is what it is. It's just, again, the comparison trips before. I was supposed to wait. I'm in agreement with everything Abraham Bolden says. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that I disagree with him on that. I think that this Abra- you know, he has some past loyalty because you know he's a former Secret Service agent sure. himself, bless him. And now, now having said that, now Abraham, he has come out and voiced suspicion about Harvey Henderson, as he has in his book. Harvey Henderson was That's a right. racist guy from Mississippi, yes. and he did say he he did just offered the caveat to me. It's in my book, Chapter Seventeen. If there was an agent on the grassy knoll, a phony agent. If there was anybody involved in a conspiracy, Harvey Henderson would have the guts, the fortitude, the motive, this, that, and the other. Uh, Harvey Henderson, as other agents admitted to me, Harvey Henderson was from Mississippi and was as racist as they come. And obviously, he's not going to take too kindly to Kennedy. And there's conflicting stories on this, whether Harvey Henderson was fired or he was let go from the White House detail. It's kind of hard to say. Ironically, Harvey Henderson ended up at the Birmingham, Alabama field office and had some threat knowledge about Martin Luther King that uh, may or may not have been conveyed in time, and Martin Luther King gets gets killed. That's another story in itself. But, uh, yeah, where I go with this is I only just name three people. Again, again mm-hmm. 1865 to the present, thousands of men and women have come and gone to Secret Service. They're a great organization. We're only talking about a, less than a handful of people here, so I don't want to cast aspersions. 
you know, it, okay, it, you touched on something else that because we've we've only got a few minutes left that I want to sure. get to as well. Patrolman Smith, when he rushed up the grassy knoll and jumped the yeah. fence and came around, uh, and he ran into um, false Secret Service agent. Can you tell that story for the folks that don't know it? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, and again, that's all in the book too. Yeah, the story is, and they might have seen it in the Oliver Stone movie, JFK, and some other books. Uh, basically, what it is is there's at least a half a dozen people, Joe Marshall Smith patrolman being one of them famously ran up the knoll or thereabouts in the vicinity immediate vicinity of Dealey Plaza were encountered with people claiming to be Secret Service agents, even showing credentials and claiming, you know, further to being agent, here's my badge, so on and so forth. Well the official Secret Service line, something people have missed for years by the way, they said the Secret Service agents in the motorcade stay with the motorcade, the sixteen agents, blah blah blah. Well, the Secret Service is only accounting for the agents in the motorcade when they make that statement. And everyone's missed that. I said, well, wait a minute, what? time out. There's agents at the field offices. There's agents that weren't stationed in the motorcade. Could it have been, instead of a fake agent, a goblin, a CIA agent, a CIA goal, could it have been an off-duty, unofficially assigned Secret Service agent there? Could it have been somebody, again, with real credentials that was, you know, posing that as well? But I offer the caveat that there are some agents that are unaccounted for that, that could very well have been there and actually were an agent, and they didn't want to reveal that because, you know, that would reveal to the public. Wait a minute. You had the grassy knoll guarded and Kennedy's killed, or as another alternative, they were sinisterly involved in a mm. plot to kill Kennedy, too. Either way, it looks bad. It's like the Glenn Bennett thing with Glenn Bennett riding in the fog car and Kennedy's killed. He's there to prevent such a thing happening, and yet it happens before his eyes. It was covered up after the fact, his presence on the trips, because it looked pretty bad to have a threat monitor, and Kennedy's killed by a threat. And yet, again, it could be for your audience out there, and one of the smoking guns in the case, I always tell people one of the biggest smoking guns is the alleged agent on the grassy knoll. But while I don't say it's necessarily true or not true, that that agent was fake, it could be that he was real. And again, it could be that he was part of the conspiracy or he was there to guard a, a very, you know, shaky part of ground security-wise, and they did not want that to come out. Well, heads would roll that, wait a minute, you had that area covered and Kennedy still killed? And then this gets even, yeah, and this gets even deeper. I was talking about the military intelligence was called away. You know, Fletcher Prouty is right on that score, by the way. Forty members of the 112th were there guarding Kennedy in San Antonio on the motorcade. I mentioned about the helicopter. Mm -hmm. Well, now, while officially they weren't there in Dallas, James Powell was there unofficially in Dealey Plaza. And lo and behold, he had a camera, and he takes a picture of the book depository right after the shooting's over with. Boy, is that amazing that they're there He's there unofficially, and yet he has a camera, and he's just there at the right place at the right time, and I offer the caveat. And again, this is spelled out in the book. Another thing I didn't list in my long list of what should and should not happen, uh, many times in these trips there was undercover detectives and agents actually in the crowds themselves. This is documented. So you need to see all these pictures of, oh, Kennedy looks so vulnerable. Look at those crowds. Many times, the, not only the police were looking down on them from buildings, but there was actually police and undercover detectives in the crowds themselves making sure the police behaved. And when you had police and military lying the street facing the crowd, you had that much more of a buffer from a fast-moving vehicle. There you have it. So while well, it might be – oh, go ahead. Don't say it's so I was going to ask you, you, what is your synopsis of this scenario? Um, do you think Oswald is involved? Do you think he was a patsy? Do you think there was uh, multiple shooters in Daly Plaza, Grassy Knoll, uh, the Dal Tex building, for example? Perhaps, as Sherry Feaster's uh, theory goes, perhaps from the southern part of the Knoll? Yeah, I, I've, I've wavered back and forth. I've been guilty of one thing. It's been having too open of a mind. I'm not wedded to any theory. In fact, it got mm -hmm. me into a little trouble back in early 2007. I actually uh, – oh, please don't throw any bricks at me, people – I actually endorsed uh, Vince Giuliosi's book for a few months until I kind of got a virtual slap in the face by Doug Horn and Jim Douglas, their books. Again, because my, my, my work does not stand or fall based on a conspiracy, even though a lot of things look bad. It could just be, you know, the Secret Service was horrifically negligent and Kennedy's killed. Where I stand now and where I stand most of the time out of that little brief uh, mental gymnastics with Vince Giuliosi that I quickly got over, I definitely believe there was conspiracy. I definitely believe there was multiple shooters. I uh, definitely think there was obviously a shot from the front as well as behind. I'm I'm very on the fence, hard the pun, <laughs> about Oswald's involvement or lack thereof. I really I'm I'm very torn, and I, you know, I'm the first person to admit I don't have all the answers. I'm the first 
Perfect. Fair enough. We've got another. Uh, Bill is here from Lake Tahoe with a question. Sure. Bill? Yes, yes. Hi, Brent. Thank you. You're very Take, welcome, my friend. First off, uh, Vince, uh, uh, if the listeners, uh, just so the listeners know, and uh, the, the uh, writer uh, Lamar Waldron in Ultimate Sacrifice gave you great kudos for helping him uh, in uh, 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 getting uh, some of the historical facts right uh, in his book, which was a great book, I thought. Oh, thanks. Yes, yeah. Lamar, I, yeah, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lamar has been on the show as well, folks. Triple W. Yeah. com. Just hit the archives. I, my question is: is that on on the return flight from uh, Dallas to Andrews Air Force Base on Air Force One? Uh, did you ever ask any of the in your interviews with the Secret Service agents that were aboard that flight? Did you ever ask any of them how Bobby Kennedy got aboard? Uh, you mean when they got the oh Andrews Air Force? Well, yeah, I mean that's that's not so good. Yeah, in the um, you can see in the black and white video the NBC footage. He's running up the front steps and he brushes past Johnson and he gets to the back. You know, he's the Attorney General, the President's brother. I don't think there's nothing to that. I don't think. Okay, because I've never seen in all the videos I've I, I, I've never seen any footage or any still photographs of Bobby Kennedy running up any gangplank onto the onto the plane. The, the, there's evidence, and I remember this. I was 13 years old when this happened. Uh, mm -hmm. When the plane was landing, all the lights at Andrew Air Force Base went out, and there's evidence that that uh, that uh, is indic indicative that the plane stopped on the tarmac. 2,000 feet up the runway, and Bobby Kennedy enters the plane. Uh, and of course, if you've read David Lifton's book, we've got we've got the body coming off. But uh, but I just wondered if you've ever I've never I've never seen a video or any pictures of and if it's there, I'd love to see it of Bobby Kennedy running up the gangplank onto the plane. Oh yeah, I tell you what, sir. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I've definitely seen it before. It's it's black and white. I'm pretty sure it's the NBC feed. It could be the CBS. Because they were all pulling, you know, the, the mm -hmm. coverage. There could be any of the networks, but yeah, you could definitely see him running up. And there's there's testimony to back up. It's pretty pretty darn solid, as solid as it can be. That he definitely ran up the front part, not not the back part, the front part. Brushed past Johnson, something Johnson never forgave him for, supposedly. And back there, comforted Jackie, and obviously seen in the little um, contraption that lowered with the casket and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, I'll say one thing though: you're on the right track as far as David Lifton. Um, his book's very compelling. I've gone back and forth on whether there's actual true body alteration, strict sense of the word, but I would highly recommend um, Douglas Horn's book. But people ask me, hey, Vince, what books do you recommend? I highly recommend the five-volume series Inside the ARB by Doug Horn. He expounds and it goes beyond David Lipton's book, with all due respect to his book, by the way, and, um, and shows some things. It's Paul has a question for us as well, Vince. Oh, sure, sure. Hi, Paul. How are you, my friend? Hey, good. How are you doing? Good, man. Where are you, my friend? I'm, I'm down in Florida. Uh, Vince and I are Facebook friends, and when we're oh, not yeah. talking, oh, how you doing? All right. When we're not talking about JFK, we're talking about Bob Moose and Pittsburgh sports. Yeah, the old pirates. Right, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Listen, I'm, hey. I still, you know, don't get me started with Willie Stargell and when he hit that home run and put the Expos out. <laughs> I'm an old Expos fan. I'm from Montreal originally, and I remember. Going to see Willie Stargell, I just love that guy. What the a team they had. We are family, yeah. baby. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry, Paul. That's okay. Um, I've read your book now twice, and I just want to tell people, you know, how really good it is. It's not just a good read, but it's it's in my reference book section. I mean, you can go back to it again and again. Uh, the question I have is, did you find any hints at all of blackmail? on any of the agents you know the way that might explain you know the way some of them were upset but the fact is if they were being blackmailed you know they did what they had to do and then and then afterwards you cry if you know what i'm saying oh yeah i definitely i let's put it this way there was a handful of agents and made famous by seymour hirsch's book and also the four that appeared on the abc special with peter jennings um that left actually three of them left the detail about a month before Dallas to go to field offices that said they were angered at President Kennedy's private life, this, that, and the other. But still, even though some of these agents might have been angered and that could have been motive for an action, oh, I definitely think there was survivor's guilt and there was remorse for actions taken and not taken by some of these people, no doubt. I think Bill Greer's tears 
at Parkland Hospital could have been legit. But I think what makes these men right for blackmail was the putrid amount of money they were making, even by 1963 standards. They were low on the totem pole of government employees, ripe for blackmail. Not even from J. Edgar Hoover, from Vice President Lyndon Johnson, you know, from the CIA. They definitely, uh, as far as money bribes or bribes or just bribes for just to exist. You want to collect a pension? You want to continue on the government? You want to, your family to be secure and everything? We'll play along here, and this is what it is. And it could very well be. And now this isn't a totally original thought, thought of mine, and I've given this to other people, uh, you know, other people credit, like George Michael Evigan and whatnot that there could very well have been a staged, a fake assassination scenario that was earmarked for Dallas and it backfired into a real assassination. And that's the reason why so many people did things that looked so bad, but there could be a logical explanation. Well, they left Kennedy saying that because they thought this was part of some sort of false flags scenario to uh, beef up security, to give Kennedy kind of like a you know good hard lesson after he survived an assassination attempt to maybe go after Cuba after all, like we should have done in the first place, darn it. And the backup plan was he was killed, and now we really will go after Cuba. We really will go after Vietnam. And But we had the short answer is I definitely think these guys, with their putrid salaries and whatnot, right for blackmail. And the loyalties, get serious. They're not, they're not making big money at It would be so easy to, to go along with a Texan from the White House, a, a colleague in the CIA, no doubt. You know. Only a minute left, folks. Any other questions? Appreciate it, Paul. Thanks okay. a lot. Hope Thanks, to meet Paul. Up with you sometime. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Thanks. folks, I just wanted to let you know that Vince Palomar has been our guest tonight. His book is called Survivor's Guilt. I would urge you all to get it with a question. Uh, it would be a great um, add-on to your library of Kennedy books. And there's a lot out there, but this one covers the Secret Service succinctly. The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect the President, President Kennedy, Survivor's Guilt, www.nightfrightshow.com. Click on tonight's guest book cover. And all the folks that we mentioned tonight, Lamar Waldron, uh, Abraham Bolden, all their archives are there as well. So there's a whole big resource for JFK fans there at the nightfrightshow.com website. Um, just to let you know, folks, I have to go to Montreal next week. Uh, Angela... And Bill have offered to do the show next week, so I won't be here. But they're, I'm going to leave you in good hands <laughs> with their question. <laughs> so I want to thank them. Angela also has a show every day on Revolution Radio, and that show takes place between 5 and 6 Eastern time. So tune in and do catch her show. Um, two minutes left. What's next for you, my friend? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, basically, uh, well, the book came out in a formal sense this past November. I'm tentatively uh, toying with not so much a sequel of me, another book on the JFK medical evidence. And basically, I've been in a lot of other people's books, and i got a lot of other people's books I'm going to be in upcoming. Uh, I have two documentaries in the can that we did this past year that I'm looking forward to seeing the light of day. One in particular, I can't get into detail right now, but it's going to be something that I think is going to be really uh, – impressive to people. It's got a whole litany of other uh, luminaries in the case are going to be involved. So I'm looking forward to some future books and of other people and documentaries and maybe another book of mine somehow, some way, and just, you know, spreading the message through my own book and that. So definitely, yeah. <laughs> That's great. There's a fellow, folks, who puts his time and his efforts into this show that's behind the scenes. He's the guy that operates my website. Uh, he helps out with iTunes as well. He puts all that stuff together for me. His name is Kelly Logue, and I want to tell people about you, Kelly, because this is a fantastic guy. He does this out of the goodness of his heart, because this show, folks, makes no money. <laughs> it's a volunteer gig for me. And um, so, again, if, if you want to make a donation, please do so I can stay on the air and do this thing properly. Uh, Kelly Logue is a great guy, folks. And here comes the music. I want to thank Vince. I want to thank Paul, Bill, and Angela for joining us all tonight. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. 